Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, dramatic footage of historic flooding in the Midwest. Forecasters say more may be on the way. Ag groups say the stress of farming and ranching is higher than ever and say treatment should be funded at five times its current level. Gary Bachman shows how to create a little whimsy in your yard. And this prison dairy exceeds the national average for output while it teaches inmates how to get ready for life on the outside. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. As if trade wars and prices bottoming out weren't enough, farmers and ranchers across the Midwest continue to worry just how fast floodwaters will fall back and allow them to recover their land. Water levels set records in six states, and even as this wave dissipates, snow melt in the northern plains mean another round of flooding is possible. Floodwaters continued to rise across the Great Plains this week, inundating dozens of Midwest riverside towns and farms. The floodwaters resulted from a calamitous combination of substantial late season winter storms, followed immediately by a spring thaw. The disaster has left at least three dead, stranded or killed large numbers of livestock, and damaged thousands of homes and businesses. The water has begun to recede in some regions, including the Platte River in Nebraska and parts of southern Wisconsin. Waters were still rising downstream along the Missouri River, as seen here in Hamburg, Iowa. Nearly half of Iowa's counties have been declared disaster areas by Iowa Governor oh, Kim you. Reynolds. It's all hands on deck. West of the Missouri River, the Nebraska Department of Agriculture was estimating the state's grain and livestock farmers are facing potential losses of $1 billion. So as particularly affected cow-calf uh, producers and, well, really any livestock that's outdoors. Vice President Mike Pence visited the state Tuesday to reassure residents that federal disaster aid was on the way. Our message is this, we're, we're with you. And the American people are going to stand with people across Nebraska, across Iowa, across all of the eight states that have been impacted by this severe weather and this flooding. Vice President, we really appreciate you coming to take a look firsthand about what the damage has been across the state, because this is the most widespread damage we've ever experienced in our state and our state's history. The Nebraska National Guard helped the state's ranchers Wednesday with airdrops of hay bales to stranded cattle herds. Local fire and rescue personnel, like these from Chapman, pitched in to rescue stranded residents. We're going to be waiting for an airboat to get here to get a gentleman out of his home. All right. Good there. Thank you. Nebraskans volunteered to pitch in and help the National Guard deliver water to communities where the supply was either unsafe or unavailable. According to the Nebraska Emergency Management Agency, Roads and other public property in the state sustained an estimated $550 million damage, while private property damage estimates were nearing $90 million. It really is an amazing thing to behold when you go into shelters across Nebraska and you find people whose houses were lost and they show up at the shelter and they want to be in the volunteer line. They said it's just property loss. If they have their lives, they and their kids want to be serving their neighbor. Flooding is expected to continue for the coming week along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers as the spring melt continues. That was Colleen Bradford Krantz reporting. The National Water Center in Tuscaloosa says that this is potentially shaping up to be an unprecedented flood season with more than 200 million people at risk of flooding in their communities. Congress is working on a $14 billion disaster aid package. 
In the Farm Week, Newswire Politico was reporting that pesticide regulators at the state level are concerned the EPA may hinder their ability to act outside of federal guidelines. It is not likely to affect the 2019 growing season and the public will be able to weigh in. And under, under existing rules, states can take localized steps, but the EPA says it is examining the current system and may initiate a different protocol. Well, if you haven't heard of CBD oil by now, you're one of the few. Since the passage of the new Farm Bill, products made from the hemp extract have been popping up everywhere, and regulators say they are having a hard time keeping up. Farmers see hemp as a new cash crop, but Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue says definitive CBD regulations won't likely be in place until 2020. Meanwhile, states are already starting to buckle down. The U.S. Court of International Trade said days ago that the president can impose tariffs. Meanwhile, Canada says NAFTA 2.0, a.k.a. the USMCA, will remain unratified until the U.S. lifts tariffs on aluminum and steel it imposed last year. That opinion echoes many in Congress on both sides of the aisle who say the new NAFTA law will be problematic until tariffs at home and abroad are lifted. It is no mystery that farm income is down. That's been the trend for years. But a new survey just released says Minnesota farm income, for example, is the lowest it's been in 23 years. The Federal Reserve says farm bankruptcies are up in the 9th District alone, which covers Minnesota, Montana, North and South Dakota, and parts of Michigan and Wisconsin. More than 100 farm BKs were filed. That's nearly three times the rate five years ago. And with all of that in mind, it is no surprise that farmers are feeling stress. Sometimes they see no way out, and groups like the National Farmers Union and many others spotlight their declining mental health. That's why the NFU and nearly four dozen other ag groups recently partnered again to send a letter to Congress urging lawmakers to do more about the situation. In that letter, they wrote, quote, we recommend fully funding the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistant Network, FARSAN, for fiscal year 2020 and ask for your support. As you know, farming is a high stress occupation, financial risk, volatile markets, unpredictable weather and heavy workloads can all place a significant strain on farmers, ranchers and farm workers mental and emotional well-being. This is exacerbated by the fact that 60% of rural residents live in areas that suffer from mental health professional shortages. The current prolonged farm economy downturn is causing even greater stress for farmers and ranchers. Congress provided $2 million for the pilot of the Stress Assistance Network this year. The ag groups described that as an on-ramp and urged Congress to fund the program fully at $10 million. On the lighter side, are you looking for a little whimsy in your garden? How about a fairy garden? Even more fun, how about a library? Here's Gary Bachman with an explanation. Here in my home landscape and garden, I'm always looking for interesting ideas to try out. A couple of years ago, I combined two ideas, a little free library and fairy gardening. The idea of a little free library is a neighborhood book exchange based on the take a book, return a book idea. Anyone can take a book or bring a book to share. It's a favorite with the kids in the neighborhood. There's a mailbox with, of course, gardening catalogs and other magazines. There's even jigsaw puzzles. Last year I added solar lights that light up at night. Underneath the little free library is where the fairy garden has been built. A fairy garden is a playful miniature garden that brings good luck to your home. They include structures, signs, hardscapes, and living plants. In the past I've grown new look celosia. Let me show you the latest fairy garden layout. This year I'm sowing small marigold seed. So let's go ahead and place the house. I think every fairy needs a little river, so let's make one using these blue glass pebbles. Now add the gazing ball, a few colorful mushrooms, a couple of birdhouses, 
and a few other garden knickknacks. And finally, the fairy who's going to call this garden home. If you'd like more information on Little Free Libraries, go to littlefreelibrary.org. There's even a Little Free Library map. Maybe there's one near you. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. And we congratulate Gary on his recent 2019 Great American Gardener Award from the American Horticultural Society. A well-deserved honor for sure Absolutely. for Gary. Well, well, let's look at what's happening in the markets this week. Here are some of the headlines. We close out March with a surprise and a cattle report. Some hard figures on China's pork problem as low timber prices continue in North Mississippi. The monthly cattle on feed report released just days ago is catching the market's attention. Noted livestock economist Daryl Peel says cattle placements are significantly larger than expected, 2% higher than at this same time in 2018. Marketings were up only slightly from last year, while total inventory of all cattle and calves on feed for slaughter is up 1% from March of 2018. Only two weeks before that, the report, the shutdown delayed February on feed numbers came out. There was less uncertainty about the impact of winter weather and flooding along the Mississippi reflected in those February figures. Extension's Josh Maples even termed the numbers to be neutral. Placements down 5%, marketings were up 3%. Uh, put it all together, you're looking at a total on feed number of 11.7 million head of cattle. So if I'm correct, that's only barely higher than it was a year ago. That's right, yeah. So the total number on feed just slightly higher than last year. Texas kind of stands out. If you look at Texas, uh, feedlots or cattle in, on feed in Texas were up 4% over the previous year. So it kind of stands out from the rest of the rest of the states. So would we kind of consider this a neutral cattle on feed report? Yeah, I would consider it a neutral cattle on feed report, uh, especially because it was delayed. You know, we're looking at, at kind of some, some data from the past. Meanwhile, over on the live cattle side of the beef market, although prices slipped a touch, they have been stronger through much of the month of March. Trader Tom Fitzenmeyer is looking over the numbers and thinks there are a few main reasons for the market's support here. I, I think there's three things. Number one, I think you're starting to see peak numbers. Mm -hmm. I think you're, you're seeing numbers back off a little bit. Number two, weather has really been hard on these cattle the last month, six weeks. I'm not sure gains have been all that great. So that's certainly a factor. And then demand for beef has been really quite good. You, uh, most of the economic data has been pretty good. You've got rising um, wages, uh, which is certainly helpful for, for beef demand. So I think all three of those have contributed. I, I think there's a good chance you'll see uh, that April contract peak up above 130 before it's done here. Meanwhile, the African swine fever story is certainly not done. And now the USDA has some better estimates on What's happening with USF, ASF, excuse me, in China? We know there are 115 outbreaks in that country. And now this week, this information, China's pig inventory will be down 13% by the end of this year. That's 374 million pigs with pork production forecast to drop 5%. Bottom line, it's estimated China will need to increase pork imports by 33% to cover its domestic needs. From one white meat to another, as we transition to our trivia quiz for the week, our question is about wild turkeys. Restoration of the turkey population in the Mid-South continues. Here it is. What is the estimated head count in Mississippi these days? Is the answer A, 165,000, B, 250,000, C, 325,000, or D, 400,000? We'll have that answer coming up for you. We'll take a short break, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, it's not Shawshank, but there's hope. The inmates who work in this prison dairy have a real track record. They milk hundreds of cows three times a day, beating the national average for output. Their dairy is self-sustaining. Most importantly, they're prepping for life on the outside. The ag work they learn here means it's as much a school as it is a farm. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. 
ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, on Thursday, April 4th from 2.30 to 6 p.m. at the Coastal Plain Branch Experiment Station in Newton, it's a forage field day. There you will learn about alfalfa production, winter grazing systems, variety selection, forage economics, drought insurance, and more. There will be a catered dinner registered by Friday, March 29th. For more information, call Jenna Mosley at 601-683-2084. Next, on Thursday, April 25th, the 66th Southern Hardwood Forest Research Group Annual Meeting. It's from 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. at the CAP Center at the Delta Branch Experiment Station in Stoneville. This year's theme, Threats to the Bottomland Hardwoods Resource. Topics include invasive plant species, chronic wasting disease, and much more. Registration is $25. For more information, call Crystal Nelson at 662-336-4800. It continues to be north versus south, so to speak, when it comes to timber prices in the state of Mississippi. For landowners generally north of I-20, fewer sawmills means more difficulty getting stands thin, and more importantly, lower prices than what's paid in South Mississippi. Extension's John Owl says the answer is simple, but not so easily accomplished. The northern part of the state has the lowest prices because it has the lowest out number of outlets for material to go to, and the, you know, the, the demand just isn't there. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I mean, that, that, would be the, the, that would be the prime area to locate uh, new facilities for the landowners in Mississippi because they are they're suffering from low demand and constantly low prices and some abysmal pulpwood prices. It's very hard to get uh, to get a pine stand thinned even in North Mississippi, in certain areas of North Mississippi. And that, and that, that has impacts on your final stand. I mean, the landowners are growing this for their, their final saw timber rotation, but if they can't get it thinned, that impacts the quality of that saw timber. And so they really need to make these, they really need to make uh, economic decisions on that thinning and try and get it done. Meanwhile, exactly the kind of development North Mississippi is hoping for is about to be built across the state line in Alabama. The Westerveld Company is building a new sawmill in Thomasville, Alabama, southeast of Meridian. The new mill will be the second largest producer of southern yellow pine lumber in the United States. It will employ 125 people when fully operational. Officials say the mill will be able to turn out about 250 million board feet of lumber each and every year. As we record this edition of Farm Week, we are just ahead of the release of the all-important March planting intentions report. The corn trade is moving lower into a pre-report position. Earlier this month, the supply-demand report lowered U.S. corn ending stocks by 100 million bushels. Analyst Elaine Cub also notes that corn ethanol exports are down in that report as well. The ethanol adjustment, I think, is, is legitimate to say that there will be less corn being used for ethanol because the ethanol situation is not all that profitable uh, lately and we, we're not seeing the, the million um, you know, gallons per day being produced anymore. So I think that is legitimate, a legitimate bearish change to those tables in the WASD report today. But the corn market didn't react overly, in an overly strong manner. We were just down a few cents, so I think we just uh, shrug it off and move on. And back to the trivia quiz now to close out this market segment. What is the estimated wild turkey population in Mississippi this year? Wildlife, fisheries and parks puts that figure at 250,000 birds. B is the right answer. For decades, prison officials have tried all kinds of ways to reduce the number of inmates coming back to jail. One approach at a facility in rural America is to teach skills on the inside that can be applied to farm work on the outside. I've never had to teach people before and I've been, been able to experience that here, so, so that'll help me out there. I was never willing to do it before. It's easy to mistake this farm on the edge of Wapen, Wisconsin for one of the thousands of dairy farms in the state. 
The reality is that the workers here are inmates in the Wisconsin prison system, and their tasks are twofold. Produce milk for other government facilities and prepare for their lives once they are paroled. It's as much a school as it is a farm. We provide inmate workers with opportunities they can use to better prepare themselves to succeed in the institutions and when they return to their families and communities. Those are opportunities to work, to learn, and to earn. Maintaining a herd of 1,100 dairy cows requires 300 man hours each day. Spread across two shifts and 33 inmates, the 400 milking cows are milked three times per day, and each animal yields 80 pounds daily, a rate above the industry standard of 66 pounds. For the Wisconsin Bureau of Prisons, the milk is the primary revenue stream, the routine, a byproduct. In accordance with Wisconsin Bureau of Prisons policy, current and former inmates are identified by only their first names. There's always, there's always that stuff, but you know, it's just go with each day and work through it and get it done. And it's all about making the whole thing function. You know, it's, I'm just a small portion of what really goes on here. So a lot of people out here doing a lot of different things and working together to get it all done, manage it appropriately. Prison officials believe the agricultural work, planting, harvest, and hands-on with animals, prepares inmates for life after their eventual release. Former inmates confirm the experience being good for them on the outside. Fernando currently manages a retail store. I liked it because uh, it put me, uh, it, it was like a discipline, you know, I mean, instead of just sitting around and not doing nothing, I, I put myself to, you know, uh, getting myself used to, uh, that way when I went back to society, you know, I was not going to just be wasting time and, you know, uh, doing something, doing something about my life, with my life. Mark is now working construction. Another thing was good was even working with the weather because no matter what, if it's rain or shine, everyone has to be here at the farm. And it's not a seven, you know, like a seven to three job. It's a seven day a week job, 365. So to be here and to show up on time and, and, and stick it out, and there's a lot of hours. I guess I learned people more than anything, different people, because when you're out here, you have to work with a lot of different people, maybe people that you would never normally in your life be around, and you can't exactly just walk away from them, so you better figure out a way to work with them. And when you can work with them and everybody gets a job done together, it, it is pretty good. While many of the inmate workers walked in with job skills, Ray often sees the soft skills of seeing a job to completion and working with others as the most valuable lessons learned on the farm. Now we like to say they learn general work skills, how to get to work every day, to get through the day in spite of challenges with people and equipment, and to get work done, to be persistent and not just spend time. Milk processing takes place a few miles away at another Bureau of Prisons facility in Wapen. The facility packages milk in half-pint boxes and five-gallon bags and also produces over 28,000 gallons of ice cream and sherbet each year. The dairy products are sold to government facilities in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and the revenues support the larger mission to train inmates for future jobs. On the outside, I'm a cook, but it, it was nice to like see the other part of this. And I, I'm actually from the third dairy state, so this is something that I can try to you know go into out there and you know like a transferable job skill. So just learning something different and coming out of this with a new job skill was you know pretty good for me. While the bureau can only bid for work from other government agencies or nonprofits, it is expected to be financially self-sustaining. Profits are spent on improving the operation of the various facilities. We submit a number of bids and we are not the winning organization. So we have to learn from those losing bids, modify our product, modify our prices, modify our delivery schedule, and get back in the game the next time we get a bid. In addition to fulfilling the dairy needs of Wisconsin state government, inmates who work for correctional enterprises return to prison at a lower rate than those who do not perform work outside the prison walls. While only a few percentage points over the average, more than two-thirds of Correctional Enterprises employees never return after being paroled. So we have a 690 batting average and we're excited to talk about that. 
Some former workers on the dairy farm find work within agriculture, but most transition to other jobs in the Wisconsin economy. For those who have been through the program, the lessons learned on 1,500 acres in central Wisconsin are about life as much as agriculture. I mean, a lot of the guys never have even worked in a farm. And uh, by them coming here, they, they learn that uh, it's okay to get your hands dirty, you know, and uh, do something for, for the right cause. That was Peter Tubbs reporting. Their output exceeds the national average. Pretty impressive. Certainly is, and uh, economics definitely working in their favor there. Yeah. And speaking of economics, next week on Farm Week, a classic lesson in agriculture, almost a total reversal of fortune. Just a few months ago, we told you about the phenomenal success of the pecan industry. It grew like wildfire over the last 20 years. But last year, thanks to Chinese tariffs and a Hurricane Michael, which took out millions of pounds of pecans, the industry is reeling. The story of that shell shock next time on Farm Week. And before we leave you today, a bit of news, sad news actually, after nearly 25 years on the job here at Farm Week, my colleague and partner on the desk, Leighton Spann, will retire at the end of April. Won't be the same without you. <laughs> Can you believe it's been that long? That's hard to believe where all the years have gone. And a little calculation, I think I've done over a thousand Farm Week shows. I have a long way to go to catch up with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been able to share a lot of uh, great stories and help support agriculture and extension, and I will miss it. Layton's last show will be the week of April 25th. In that show, he and I will sit a spell and discuss what he's learned in a quarter century of agricultural reporting. You want to do the honors? Well, remember, if you missed the story, look for the past episodes at our website, farmweek.tv. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next week.